Bienvenue à tous. Welcome to Reporters. From Spain Cat's insight on the headline stories from all around the world. In this edition, we take you to Timbuktu, the ancient city in the Sahara Desert, now free from the barbaric control of Islamist extremists. French and Malian soldiers have been welcomed there by the local people as liberators. The testimony of local people is moving and disturbing how they became the innocent victims of the warped ideology of the Al-Qaeda-linked radicals. The search for remaining insurgents is being led by Mali's soldiers. Some have been accused of exacting their own revenge on the Arab community in Timbuktu. Fearing retribution, most of the city's Arab community has fled. Those who remain, as our reporters witnessed, face an arbitrary and uncertain fate. Our reporting team in Timbuktu is Eve Irvine and Alexandre Renard. This is their report. The most distant place imaginable. North of the Malian capital, some 900 kilometers across the desert, lies the town of Timbuktu. The fabled city has been free of tourists for many months and just recently freed from radical Islamists who had taken control last March. Getting a car here has become more difficult after fleeing Islamists destroyed the motors of the blue barges that used to ferry vehicles across. In the heart of Timbuktu, the rhythm of normal life is starting to return. Music and parties are once again permitted, but since the 28th of January, when the town was freed, there is a new beat on the street. French and Malian troops patrol through the streets throughout the day, searching for any abandoned weapons, ammunition or Islamists that may have melted into the population. There are Islamists still hiding in houses or in the nearby forest. As long as the French military are here, we know it's not over. When it's all back to normal, they'll go back to France. The rebel fighters had imposed a strict form of Sharia, stoning suspected adulterers, amputating the hands of thieves and forcing women to wear full veils. It's only in recent days, under the reassuring eye of international troops, that women with stalls at the market have started to show their faces again. Nearly all of the women here say they suffered violently under the rebels' control, when public floggings were commonplace. When the Islamists were here, everything, even our hands, had to be hidden. If they saw your hands, you would get five lashes. We had to wear gloves and long sleeves when we were here on the market. If they saw even a fingertip, they would whip you. But while some stalls enjoy renewed freedom and business, one row of shops is now completely empty, looted by locals just a day after the military's arrival, on the assumption that the light-skinned Arabs who own the stores fraternized with the rebels. The vast majority of Arabs, the town's commercial class who owned and ran the biggest shops, have fled. The first families ran because of the fighting, more left when Freedom Chem, afraid of revenge attacks. Only three of Timbuktu's 500 Arab families remain, living here in this deserted neighborhood. Two brothers, Dana and Mohammed, are hanging on, selling their salt and refusing to leave their home and business. Huh? Our neighbors have fled, men, women, the elderly, they've all gone, even those who had nothing to do with the Islamists. The elderly and the women, it was obvious they had nothing to do with all of that, and yet they fled. I'm not afraid. If I was, I would be gone. But why should I be afraid? Of what? 13-year-old Bukhar doesn't see what the fuss is about. His friends are still his friends. He's just happy the Islamists have gone. These are my friends, Hamma, and the other one is Manu. The Islamists have run away now, and the house of one of them, the one that used to hit me all the time, has been destroyed. Bukhar's dad agrees that the men to fear are gone and insists that his family should have nothing to worry about. We don't encounter any hatred from locals. Everyone knows who worked with the Islamists and who didn't. The government and the army weren't here, but the people were. People know who collaborated. The military have come to see us, and I went to see them in their camp. They told me I had no cause for concern. 
Nah, det är mycket Just around the corner is another Arab household. The head of the family, 70-year-old Ali, is a herdsman, and he and his son also run a small shop. Ali is well known in the area and won't entertain the idea of leaving, even if he's aware of growing tension. I always have my ID and permits in my pocket in case someone stops me and asks me something. No one's made any racist remarks to me. Timbuktu is my home. This is my country. My parents died here. My grandparents too. My family was here even before the French colonized. We are from Mali. Ali's son is conscious that some people now mistrust his family, but he tries not to focus on that. At the start of the troubles, our shop was broken into and everything was taken or broken. But otherwise, life goes on as before. Money comes, money goes. Ali and his neighbor Mustafa have been close friends for many years. Mustafa has faith in Ali, but believes that he is one of the only Arabs that wasn't involved with the Islamists. There isn't one other Arab in the area that didn't have weapons or ammunition in their shop or home. But Ali, they searched his home and the stall he sells at, and they didn't find even one bullet. Most of the Arabs fled to refugee camps in neighboring countries. Some of those who stayed have been arrested and are being held with other prisoners suspected of being collaborators with the radical Islamists. The police headquarters, which was used as a base by the rebels, was razed to the ground by the French airstrikes. So the police and the army are now working hand in hand at this military barracks in the center of town. Soldiers, who abandoned the town 10 months ago, now present their latest detainees. Seven men arrested in Timbuktu and neighboring villages. This man was the first one we arrested in the nearby town of Le Rey. Working with the police, we managed to capture all these people that you see here today. The head of the local police is also here. This man comes from Nigeria, and this one comes from Algeria. He says he is here to teach the Quran and Sharia in Mali. These two come from Timbuktu. This young man is 19 years old. He is studying the Quran, and he says he was forced to work as a chef. He was arrested by the army, and this man we suspect of training the Islamic police. The suspects are led back into their cell, waiting to be judged. But the government institutions, the courts and officials have yet to come back to Timbuktu. While waiting for the authorities to return, locals are starting to pitch in. These men spend their spare time searching for anything left behind by the fighters. So what have you brought us today? We found these weapons in town. Sometimes these men venture into homes previously occupied by the Islamist fighters. They are helping us clear up anything that could be dangerous. Weapons, booby traps, they bring it all. Even documents they find that can help us ascertain who was involved, who has or had connections with the terrorists. We know where they were. We know the houses they lived in. All the administration buildings, the big houses. They took them all. There are still a lot of places left that need to be cleared, and it's still not sure that all the jihadists have gone. Barely have the weapons been handed over when the Arab herdsman Ali arrives at the camp. He wants to give the army a present of a bull to thank them for the part they played in freeing the town. But his gesture is met with little enthusiasm, and he's promptly asked to leave. The whites there. See them off the camp. We don't want them here. This is the last time we will see Ali. Once the camera is gone, the bull is brought back into the military barracks. The next day, a crowd has gathered in front of Ali's house. His neighbors are visibly upset, 
and extremely worried. Ali has been taken away. It's so, so sad. It breaks my heart. It breaks all our hearts. Ali is a peaceful man, and we just want to be able to live in peace. This woman saw everything. She's the only one who dares to speak, the others too afraid of what the Malian army might do. A military truck pulled up and they went straight into Ali's house. They didn't ask any questions or give him a second to speak. He was so afraid he found it hard to get into the truck, so they just pushed him in and took him away like that. Ali had nothing to do with the terrorists. If the terrorists did come by, he always told them that he wanted to be left in peace. Seriously, seriously, if we could just come together as a people and stage a peaceful protest so that this confusion ends. There were other arrests made the same morning. Back around the corner at the brother's salt shop, Bukar is in tears. The army came and took my dad away. They put a tarpaulin over him. The Malian army. Just like that, without any reason to do so. They didn't say anything. They just took him. Bukhar was present when the arrests were made. His grandfather, who has come to look after him, can't understand what has happened. They wanted to take me too in their truck. <laughs> but in the end, they told me to stay. They were born here in Timbuktu. We've never left this town. Anyone who committed a crime wouldn't have stayed here now. All our lives, our work is here. The Malian army denies that it participated in the arrests, but for Arab families in Timbuktu, today the town's freedom has left them living in fear. They worry about revenge attacks, arrests and even being killed by the forces there to protect them. Mohamed Lamin, the director of this madrasa, an Arab, was arrested on the morning French troops took control of the town. I saw the Malian army stop in front of his house and then they left. I went by to see what had happened, and his family told me he'd been arrested. I haven't seen him since. Residents say it's possible Lamine had relatives among the rebels. Eleven days after his arrest, two bodies have been found in the dunes, less than two kilometers outside of town. Lamine's young wife and her parents go to see what many locals have told them is her husband's grave. They see the cloth protruding from the sands, they start to dig, and very quickly can confirm that it is Lamine. <laughs> My daughter came to me and told me her husband had been arrested. I told her to be strong, that if he had done something wrong, he would get a hearing. For my part, I have total confidence in our army. I believe in our justice system. But sadly, what has happened is that I have just found his body. A week after the arrest of Ali and the two brothers, the men are still missing. Tensions between ethnic groups have existed for decades, but now the Arab minority says it's increasingly the target of revenge for the radical Islamist occupation. Our reporter Eve Irvine is with us here in the studio. Eve, clearly Timbuktu damaged in, in every sense. How tough is it for people to get their lives back to something like normal? Well, it's only the start of that getting back to normal. Music is back on the street. Uh, there is uh, that sense of freedom, if you like. You know, the women at the market are, are saying that they now feel they're getting there. They feel once again uh, at peace. At the same time, you can see that the tension, the trauma it lingers on. Uh, we were at the, the first day of school in 10 months. You know, great joy as they spring clean the classroom. But already the girls there, like the women at the market, were still wearing the veils. And when we asked them why, they said they hesitated a lot. They said, well, you know, my mammy says I should. And then finally said, well, you never know the Islamists, the radical Islamists could come back. Um, one girl even said, well, I think they were right. You know, this protects my body, uh, this veil. So there was still the, the, the that pressure of 10 months, almost 10 months, has definitely left its effect. There's the trauma of that, and there's also this growing paranoia, if you like, that some of their neighbours aided and abetted these uh, these fighting rebels. Uh, so really a lot, a lot to do in terms of that. And again, Timbuktu is still pretty much cut off. It is deemed safe, but the roads around it aren't. Why are the Arabs in particular in Timbuktu being targeted? I understand that you actually spoke with the Malian army, and they said something really shocking. What did they say? 
Well, indeed, once they had been reassured that our cameras were off, our mobile phones were off, we had gone to the military barracks after the, these men that we had interviewed had been arrested to find out where the men had gone. Um, now, both the police and the army said that they had not detained these men, they knew nothing about it, but one of the army men did look us directly into the eye and say, well, in any case, all the Arabs are radical Islamists, all of them, um, which does send a shiver up the spine. But sadly, this is something that a lot of the people in the town seem to be telling us as well. And even neighbours who said, well, these are Arabs, I know them well, I trust them, they have nothing to do with the, the fighters that were there. They still said, but the majority are. Um, some weapons were found in some of the shops uh, owned by Arabs that have fled. But again, it, it's just strange to typecast an entire ethnic group. Now, in Mali, there have been tensions between the rich mix of ethnic groups for many years. And I think this has just kind of put a little bit of fire into that powder keg. Very briefly. Eve, the uh, Prime Minister of Mali says that those who carry out abuses will be held to account. How widespread are the abuses? Hard to tell, but indeed uh, what we have seen in uh, other journalists and indeed Human Rights Watch issued a report today, there seems to be at least a handful of cases in Gao, in Duenza and in Timbuktu. Uh, so, you know, more like the shown on that, the Malian army says they are investigating, but it seems that uh, there is at least uh, a dozen or so cases around the country. Eve Irvine, thank you very, very much indeed. If you'd like to see Eve's report again, you can via our website, France 24. Dot com. You're watching reporters. Stay with us here on France Fancat.